Howdy folks, today we're going to find out how you can take better photos right after this. Welcome to Camera Shake, where we bring you the insider scoop on all things photography and videography, giving you a unique opportunity to stay ahead of the curve. We've spent literally hundreds of hours interviewing some of the most renowned photographers of our time, giving you access to knowledge and expertise that's not available anywhere else. As always, I'm your host, Kirsten Nutz. And if you enjoy this content, consider lending your support on buymeacoffee.com forward slash camera shake to help us create more exciting episodes for you. Your support really does make a difference. But without further ado, let's give it up for today's special guest, the wedding and portrait photographer, podcasting legend, speaker, educator, and the only Cajun I know that's hotter than my mama's jambalaya. Give it up for Mr. Bure Perry. Bure, <laughs> how are you, man? I'm good. I'm good. I'm very excited about the guests that you're going to have on the show today that's going to help us become better photographers. I'm I, who, Who's the other guest? Who's the actual good <laughs> photographer who's going to be on the show? Uh, well, I, you know, when I thought about when I thought about this episode, I thought there's only one person I could possibly ask to come on the show for that, and that was you. Oh, clearly. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sorry that your podcast has reached these heights uh, or lows, <laughs> I should say. Also, technically, by the way, not a Cajun. I just grew up in Cajun country. Oh, okay. Where yeah, you like born? for instance, you're you're you know you're British, but I don't know. Are you Brit? What are you? Are you where are you? Wales, Scotland? Where are you at? Oh, <laughs> I actually live in. So I live in England, but I'm not British at all. I'm actually German. Um, I'm so well, see, there you go. There, you, there you go. See, I assume you're British because you live in England, and you assume I'm a Cajun because I grew up in Louisiana. But actually, no, I'm I'm like a mutt. I don't know what I am. My ancestry is from all over, but I'm not Cajun. I just grew up there, and I have a Cajun name. I spend a, quite a bit of time in New Orleans, actually, back in the '90s. Um, so oh, no. it's. You know, hence, hence the the family tradition of gumbos and jambalayas is still oh. very much being upkept <laughs> in, in this. New Orleans place. is a great city. New Orleans is one of the few cities in America that has its own personality. Like you know, like there's cities in America that you, like New Orleans is New Orleans, and there's nothing else like it. Or if you live there, it's New Orleans. Uh, there's nothing else like New Orleans. Uh, uh, there's nothing else like Miami. There's nothing else like New York. There's nothing else like Seattle or San Francisco. But then you get other cities like I don't know. Indianapolis or St. Paul, that they're all interchangeable. They're just cities. You know what I mean? They don't have like a flavor to them. But New Orleans, there's just no, there's no place else on the planet like New Orleans. It, exactly. I mean, there's, there's such a deep rooted tradition. Back when I, when I lived in New Orleans, um, you know, I was, I was a musician back in those days. And of course, I think, you know, the best school I've ever had when it comes to music and the blues in general was just simply being there. I mean, for me, that's, oh, yeah. you know, that's what did it. Oh yeah, yeah. If you like music and you like to eat, New Orleans is your town. And drink if you like to drink. You like to drink. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't remember much. It must have been good, I guess. <laughs> anyway, Bure, it's uh, great to have you back on the show. Of course, this is your second time on the show because last time um, you were on the show with uh, with with Gary Hughes back in the day. And of course, for those uh, listeners and viewers, I remember uh, only a few back a few weeks ago. Um, Gary was on the show as well. We were talking about, um, well, how we can save ourselves from the assault, the onslaught of the AI robots, clearly. But today, we're here to talk about really some some photography fundamentals. And the reason why I thought Bure was going to be the perfect person um, for the job was because I actually love your YouTube channel. Um, it's I've been really I've been watching, you know, I've been following your YouTube channel. Ever since the lofty days of the, you know, uh, X100F, actually, back in the day. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I have a lot of X100 users uh, who follow the channel because I have that camera and I use it a lot. Hang on, I've got it right back here. There you go. For those of you watching on YouTube, it's this one right here. Way. Uh, but yeah, um, a lot of X100 users uh, follow that channel and um, I love them. I, I get all types, really. I get everything from I've never owned a camera before to I'm an award-winning, you know, photographer and uh, and everything in between. Yeah, I mean, you in your so in your day job as a wedding photographer, I know you've um, you know you've um, you know you've been lucky enough to to been awarded you know numerous awards for your work. Um, and I remember, I remember back like some time ago, you switched from Canon to Fuji. Even for your professional work, what was the what was the main reason for that? 
Well, um, by the way, I would say probably I do more corporate portraits and headshots now than anything else. Um, I still do weddings. I still do bar mitzvahs. Uh, but it's uh, I, probably an even mix between between those three. Um, so what happened was um, COVID hit, right? And I had just done a job with a friend of mine who photographs uh, homeschoolers, people who homeschool, right? They have this giant graduation ceremony in Orlando every year where all the homeschoolers in the state come and that way they get to walk the stage and receive their diploma with all of their peers. You know, they get to do this, which is something you don't do if you're a homeschooler because you don't go to an actual school. And so it's a great event. And he covers this thing. And in covering this, he also does uh, the actual portraits, cap and gown portraits. So it's just the sort of job I love because it's high pressure. So I'm backstage and I'm set up with my, my his backgrounds and lights and the whole nine yards. And then as they're coming up on stage and receiving their diploma, I'm backstage taking their portrait before they go up. So if there's a mistake, if the line gets slow, the whole proceedings are going to come to a stop. <laughs> right. So it's extremely pressure filled. You got to put them in the chair. You got to pose them, blah, blah, blah. I've got his, his wife does all the posing for me. And I'm just basically clicking the shutter at this point and saying, that's good. And so what happened was uh, after we did that, uh, she came back to me and she said, you know, some of your files were um, a little soft. Your images were a little soft on some of them. I was like, yeah. I'm using a Canon 7200 millimeter lens on my Canon 5. And, you know, that lens has been through hell and high water and 500 beach weddings. And it's been covered in sand and muck and everything. And it's probably due to be replaced. And now, and I mean replaced because, because it's out of service now. So now I'm faced with replacing a $2,000 lens. On top of that, um, my camera's not getting any younger and the age of mirrorless is here. And everyone is switching to mirrorless and the obvious benefits that come from a mirrorless camera. So... Now I'm thinking, well, I'm going to have to switch to a, a mirrorless uh, camera, switch, go ahead and upgrade to the Canon mirrorless. And then I'm going to have to buy this lens, which is going to cost me another 2000 or more. And then eventually I'm going to want to replace my other lenses too, because you can buy an adapter, but how long are you going to really use that adapter, right? Eventually you're going to want to get the native lenses designed for the system. So I started doing all the pricing on it. And I don't remember what the total price tag was, but it came out somewhere around seven or $8,000. Meanwhile, I've got this Fuji X100V, and I had the uh, S, and I had the F, I think, yeah. And I love this camera, and I've gotten used to the menu system, and I love the color science, and I really like it a lot. And so I started toying with the idea of, okay, if I'm looking at replacing my entire kit, what if I was to switch and go over to another brand, which is, you know, some photographers do that a lot, but then there's other photographers who are like, I'm a Nikon guy and I'm staying with Nikon forever. By the way, try not to interrupt me so much with all the talking. Uh, the, <laughs> you asked me a question and an hour later, and thanks for listening to the podcast. Brilliant. So I, uh, so I, uh, so I um, decided, okay, let's look into this. So um, I started comparing price because I'm a businessman and price is important. So once I made the decision that Fuji works for me, Fuji can do the job, then I started comparing price and because it's Fuji and because it's APS-C instead of full frame, the price was unbelievable in terms of savings. So I replaced my entire kit, I, my camera, my backup camera, all three lenses. I bought a brand new bag, which I love. The Think Tank Airport bag is fantastic because it's got four wheels on the bottom so you can roll it all around. You can take it into elevators really easily. Uh, I replaced, that's a $300 bag. So I had to replace a lot of stuff that I didn't, ha wouldn't have had to replace if I had just gone, upgraded my Canon. I had to replace a lot of stuff. I had to replace my flashes and everything. And when it was all said and done, I still saved thousands of dollars over if I had stayed with full frame and I had stayed with Canon. So then the real question became, what about my, what about the quality of the work? You know, going to APS-C, what about the quality of APS-C versus full frame? And that's a whole other discussion we can have, but... Um... Well, exactly. And I think, you know, especially for, for people starting out, you know, buying their first camera, their, their first sort of, you know, in inverted commas, you know, proper camera, um, that's, all, that's often a question that comes up. You know, do I start with, you know, uh, APS-C sensor cameras, which are not quite as expensive as full frame, or, you know, am I going to drop thousands of dollars on, on a full frame camera but in what was your experience with that moving to APS-C for your for your professional work 
the, my experience was that it was it was fine. I mean, I started in APSC and then I went to full frame, and now I've come back to APSC. But the thing you have to wonder, yeah, the thing you have to understand about sensor size is it's all it's not a myth, <laughs> but there's a what's the word I'm looking for? There's an idea that has been put into people's heads that certain things are better than other things when it comes to photography, and that's not necessarily true. So, for example, if you're using a full frame camera. Uh, if you're shooting the same image, same composition from the same distance, uh, then, well, not, no, I'm sorry. If you're shooting the same composition with a full frame that you are with an APS-C camera, you're going to have a more shallow depth of view with the full frame than you are with the APS-C camera. There's a video on my channel that explains all the details of this. Uh, F2.8 is F2.8, no matter what camera you put it on, it's the same depth of field. But if you're using an APS-C camera, then because of the crop factor, in order to take the same picture with an APS-C camera that you take with a full frame camera, you either have to zoom out or back up. And either one of those things will affect your depth of field. So you won't have a shallow depth of field. So people love to say, well, you know, that's one of the problems with APS-C is you don't get that shallow depth of field. It's not as shallow. It's about one stop difference. And what they don't really talk about is what if you're a person who doesn't need a more shallow depth of field? <laughs> Why is it that we assume that we need a super shallow depth of field all the time. There are many photographers who don't need a more shallow depth of field. They actually need a little bit more deep of a depth of field, and I'm one of them. If you're working on a dance floor, I'm not worried about the, I, if I'm shooting dance floor pictures at a reception, I'm not worried about how shallow my depth of field is. I'm worried that the person behind the person is not gonna be in focus. If I'm shooting three rows of people in a wedding party, I'm worried about focus through that whole field much more than I'm worried about how shallow the depth of field is behind the group. So in my case, that particular issue is actually a bonus. Uh, it works out good for me. You know, I can shoot wider with an APS-C camera, get more light in the camera and get the same depth of field that I get with my other camera, my full frame camera, with less light. So in that respect, it's actually a bonus. You get more light with an APS-C camera. And, and in terms of the quality, we are way past the point of quality being a problem when it comes to a, being a commercial professional photographer. There isn't, there isn't, I could go get a camera, I could shoot my everything with a Panasonic Lumix Micro Four Thirds camera and I would never have a client who ever said a word to me about the quality of the images. You know, it's just, oh, every, yeah. you, can't, you can't buy a bad camera anymore. They're all good. The quality is up there. We're talking, I, I walk into a reception and shoot at ISO 3200 without even thinking twice about it. And if I have to, I'll go to ISO 6400. And I can remember 15, 20 years ago, you didn't go above 800, <laughs> yeah, right? Absolutely. For the grain and the noise, right? So they're all so good now that nitpicking about the quality and pixel peeping at 100%, it's really not doing you much good. What's more important is, you know, for your business, what's it going to cost you? And then the specific needs that you have of the camera. And I think that APS-C's time has come, to be quite honest, in the same way that we can talk about, well, the problem with APS-C is you don't get the same uh, depth of field that you get with full frame. No, but uh, with full frame, you don't get the same depth of field that you get with medium format. So how come you're not shooting with medium format? That's the question I always have for the full frame people. I'm like, oh, so if that's exactly, so important to you. Yeah. It was exactly yeah, the I'm same sorry. discussion back when when things went from, you know, medium format to 35 minute yeah. film. I mean, it's just, you know. The same discussion. Yeah, we went from medium format. There was a time when if you were a commercial photographer back in the film days, um, you, in your studio, can you hear that? <laughs> yeah. somebody's, somebody's at the door. Uh, back in your studio, if you were shooting, you shot medium format. And you might use 35 millimeter on location. But medium format most of the time to get those big negatives and to get the, the quality that you wanted. And then at some point, 35 millimeter became good enough. And a new generation of photographers came along and they were like, oh, you know, why go medium format? It's so expensive and everything else. So why not I just go with 35 millimeter? It gets the job done. And that's where we are, I think, with, with APS-C, with crop sensors. It gets the job done. An APS-C camera today is every bit as good as a medium format camera was 15 years ago. I'm not, I'm sorry, as good as a full frame camera was 15 years ago. And if it was good enough then, it's good enough now. So yeah, I, th I think APS-C is, is coming hard on against full frame. And there will be a day when people will talk about full frame cameras the way that we talk about uh, medium format, you know? Yeah. And, and then eventually, and eventually micro four thirds will come in because everything's building from the ground up. All the money is being put into the processors and the sensors that go into phones. That's where all, yeah. that's where all the innovation is happening in machine learning and so forth. So, you know, everything gets smaller 
I don't care what you what you buy or what you make. Everything is smaller. So, yeah, there's, that's my story. And it's hey, it's the podcast is over. Naya, thanks everybody. <laughs> that's it. That's all you need to know. <laughs> yeah. If you're new to the photography game, don't worry with full frame. Just go straight. The bottom line is the bottom line is I love Fuji. I love their cameras. Um, I just like them, and they absolutely do the job that I need them to do. And they're less expensive than full frame, so why not? And of course, I mean, you know, the I think the one point is for me is always, you know, it's if you know if you love the tool, if you, if you like taking pictures with a particular camera, for example, then it will motivate you to take more pictures. You know, that's that's the thing. That's that's really ultimately why. I ended up falling in love with the X100F is just because I realized that, you know, when I took my big Nikon body and three different lenses out on a family family trip, I would never actually take any pictures because it was such a kerfuffle, you know, having to take the camera right. out of the backpack and putting it. So, you know, you end up not not doing it. But with a smaller camera, that's actually fun to use. You know, that's a lot more, you know, it's more tactile. You know, it just feels good. It looks pretty cool, you know, and it just, you know, it, it has dials and it's just a little bit more physical. It's just more fun. And because it's more fun, you end up taking more pictures. But of course now- You know, I think, that's really, I think that's really important too, especially when you're a professional photographer, because when you take something you love that, uh, that's your hobby and that you love it and you turn it into a profession, it stops being your hobby. And so you find yourself not wanting to pick up your camera when you're not getting paid. And so anything that you can do to bring back that feeling of just fun. When I see my camera, when I see my X100V, I want to pick it up. And when I see it on the table, I'm like, is there something I can take a picture of? I'll just pick it up and take pictures of stupid things around the house just because I want to take pictures. And I haven't felt that feeling in, you know, forever since you were a kid, since you first uh, you got your first camera. And so that is something that you cannot underestimate the value of that. You really can't. And, and that's one of the things that I love about about Fuji's cameras, even though I even though I um. I definitely broke with the fanboys because I switched to the Fuji X-H2 when I was using uh, the X-T4 and I got rid of the dials. So I, now I'm using the, the, the Fuji camera that, that it looks just like every other camera that's out there. <laughs> but the truth is the dials are great, but for a professional photographer, you really don't use yeah. them. No, of course. You know, yeah, absolutely. You it's that's, you know, again, for that particular purpose, it does get in the way. You know, because you, yeah. you have to be. You're fast. not gonna you're not gonna take them down and go. Let me change my shutter speed by reaching up on top and taking a dial. You're gonna have it all all mapped to dials under your fingers, and you're gonna do it all with your eye in the viewfinder. And so they're cool. Yeah, I like them. Sometimes on a tripod they might be nice, but um, ultimately, no. And also, I did a video about this on my channel too. Also, the ergonomics. If you're carrying a camera like that with a big lens on it, you need a big big pistol grip on it. And the Fuji X-H2 is the one that has the big pistol grip. Yeah. And, you know, even I mean, talking about size, like, you know, just in comparison, if you compare something like, you know, um, an APS-C sensor camera, typically speaking, what you'll find is, you know, the bodies are a little bit smaller, the lenses are a little bit smaller. You know, if you compare that to um, like a, a Nikon Z8 or, you know, a Canon R5 plus, you know, with the whole shebang on it, like, I don't know, 70 to 200 or something, you're actually carrying quite a lot of weight with you. And that's, that in itself can be a pain in the backside. Well, what was tough for me was that um, I did that, right? And I made that switch and went to the, I, I want the smaller camera, I want the lighter camera. And then I discovered that I have big hands and the smaller camera was more uncomfortable for me to use. So I actually, I'm actually better with a brick. Like I, like, I've, like I thought, I wonder what would be like to use medium format. You know, Fuji makes a great medium format line. I wonder if that would right. really be the most comfortable thing in my hand because I had big hands. But I had big problems with the X-T4 because on a long day, it would just dig into my hand because it was just so small. I was like mm, trying to hang on to it, you know. And now once I've got the X-H2 in my hands, I'm like, now here we go. This is something I've got a grip on. But I've got big hands. If you don't have big hands, if you're, you know, then absolutely the smaller camera is, is more valuable for you. Of course, nowadays, you know, I, I speak to a lot of people who really enjoy taking pictures with their phones. And that's, of course, you know, in a sense, um, phones for me, in my mind, are pretty much where, you know, little um, point and shoot cameras were 10, 15 years ago, you know, where everybody's got a phone on them. They're easy. They're, you know, lightweight. You can take them around with you. And actually, you can really learn the basics of photography just by using your phone. You don't necessarily even need an actual camera. Well, here's the thing about the basics of photography that I have discovered is um, when people get into it and they're like, oh, I want to learn photography. 
So they got to learn this exposure triangle and they've got to use shutter speed. They got to learn all that kind of stuff, all that technical stuff. And then it takes them sometimes years after they've learned that to learn basic composition. And yeah, so yeah. what we're seeing now with the phones is, is the opposite. It's just all about composition because the phone does everything for you. So all you have to concentrate is what's the angle? You know, how, how do I want to present this? How do I want to make this picture look? So I think we're getting a new crop of photographers of people who start with their phones when they're kids, who they come in understanding composition and posing much better than we did when we first started out. And it was all technical, technical, and technical. Like my daughter knows yeah. how to pose for the camera. She doesn't know anything about the exposure triangle, but she knows what a, po a good pose looks like. Yeah. You know, and she knows how to do it. So we have a whole generation that's that's coming uh, that's coming that way. And I've been like with my education efforts, I've been going in that direction. Like on my on my YouTube channel and and on my website, I have ebook. I make ebooks, right? And so my ebooks are geared more towards the technical, because in the beginning, I'm like, you need to learn these technical things. But then the really extensive ebooks are on things like just understanding light. You know, I'm, I'm amazed at how many people understand the exposure triangle and depth of field and, and camera shake and all the things you need, the technical things you need to know in order to use a camera. But they can't look at a person and recognize that there's modeled light on their face. You know, they, they just don't see it because that's, an, that's really an acquired thing. You know, I, how many times have you been out and you've seen somebody taking a picture of their family and you look at it and you're like, oh, my God. That's horrible light. You need to turn them. <laughs> you yeah. want to go over and shake them. You know, can't you see that the sun is coming from 90 degrees to the left and half their face is in shadow and half their face is light? Can't you see that? And they can't see it because yeah. you, your whole life, you've seen it with your regular eyes and your eyes just make the adjustment for you. If you look at the left side of the face, your eyes adjust for that. If you look at the right side, your eyes adjust for that. So you don't think about it. But the camera, it's just it's taking a picture based on one side or the other, and, and the other side is going to look like crap. So yeah. my, um, my personal favorite, also, my per yeah, my personal favorite is when people you know place themselves so that they are facing the sun, so that they you know so that their face is well lit, but then end up squinting in the photo. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> my my so personal lovely. favorite, my personal favorite, most annoying thing is when it's like, oh, take a picture of the five of us. And the person taking the picture uses the, the uh, phone in vertical mode. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they and they, they back way up. And so it's like the middle of the middle of the picture has got the tiny five people in it. And then there's eight miles of sky and eight miles of ground. And you just want to walk up there and go turn your camera to the horizontal position so you can get in close and you get a picture where you see everybody and it's beautiful and no one does it because they're just hardwired to look at their phone a certain way and have the pictures look that way. And and they think it's wrong. Yeah. Oh, what? Then it comes with my phone, it's small. Well, yeah, we could turn your phone, it'll be the whole size of your phone. What? <laughs> That's just weird. I should look at it always. Everything should be vertical on this long 16.9 and it's just, it's ridiculous. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, you but you can't fight it. No, of course not. On, hey, by the way, by the way, on the other side, I almost never shoot vertical. I shoot horizontal constant. I, I used to shoot vertical all the time, like at events, but now I rarely shoot vertical. I'll just shoot horizontal all day and then crop. Yeah. Uh, well, exactly. That's exactly what I do. Like especially with headshots, for example, I always, I always yes. shoot um, horizontal because then you know then I have options later on. You know, I could. You know, exactly. I could go for a traditional headshot. You know, and crop it so it looks more like an eight by ten or something like that. Um, you know, vertical, or I could, you know, or I could crop it differently. So it looks more like, uh, you know, a, a landscape, uh, Peter Hurley style type of headshot, but you have the options anyway, afterwards. Yeah, that's, I, and, and now that we're shooting with such large files, it's no problem to crop away half the file and still have it be a completely usable image. You know, so exactly. yeah, I shoot every, I shoot everything in landscape. Uh, when you start going, when you start going vertical, it's too phony. And I mean, phone, <laughs> quite like, literally, you know? <laughs> yeah. so that's a takeaway there. Always shoot wider because you could always crop it afterwards. You know, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't, I don't know. Some people who are like, you know, who, who are, um, what do you call it? Who are basically of the opinion that you should never crop and you should just get it right in camera. But Hey, well, what if we got these file sizes for nowadays, if not that? Yeah. I go back and forth on it. I think it depends on the circumstance. Um, like with, with headshots, no, with headshots, give yourself some space because what if they need a square crop and what if they need a, you know, a different crop? So they sure, but at events, um, when in doubt, I shoot wide, but there's plenty of times, 
especially table shots. Like I'll be doing table shots. And then when I go in to get these ready for the client, it's like, okay, every one of these table shots and the table shots, my table shots, I, I do each person or each group, each, each couple. So it's nothing but shot after shot of two people with their heads tilted towards each other sitting at a table, right? This couple, this couple, this couple, this couple. And I'm going in and I'm cropping each one of them to fill the frame. And I'm like, Bure, you've done a million of these. Why don't you just zoom in and do it in camera when you shoot it? And then you won't have to spend 30 minutes on cropping each one of these correctly. You know, so yeah. I, 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 you, you always have an instinct, I do anyway, to err on the side of extra space because then you know you've always got room to do. And also it's going to give you it's going to give you extra depth of field. So it's, you're more likely to not have a problem with focus. And, and so I haven't, but with, he, with uh, table shots, I've been trying lately to force myself to be like, just zoom in tight and shoot it. It's going to be fine. It's a table shot, you know, yeah. <laughs> just zoom in tight and shoot it. Um, yeah, that's right. But, yeah. I mean, but that's, of course, the consideration there is from a professional point of view is that, you know, if you have to, even if it just takes you 10 seconds extra to edit each picture, you know, once you're once you're editing three thousand shots, that adds up to a humongous number, and so the amount of extra time you spend on a job is just nuts. You know, in comparison, three thousand shots. Are you shoot weddings? Uh, I don't. Well, not not voluntarily. I would say <laughs> I shoot events. <laughs> like I shoot. I shoot. Well, I, I put it this way: I don't advertise the fact that I shoot weddings. I only shoot weddings when I'm asked to shoot a wedding. Um, right. Who am I to say no? You know. But um, but I shoot a lot of events, mainly corporate events. Right, right. And when you do corporate events, do you find yourself doing a lot of cropping after the fact? Um, again, I used to in the beginning, yes. Um, and just like yourself, you know, I got myself to the point where I figured if I can get it as close as possible, so that I don't have to spend extra time on each right. on each image. Um, one of the one of the issues I've actually found switching from DSLR to mirrorless is that my keeper rate is so much higher because the autofocus is so much better. And so, you know, before I could basically say, well, you know, yeah, I, I come home with 3000 shots, let's say, and that's probably, I don't know, let's say 1500 or 1800 or whatever that are probably good. You know, now it's like 2,995. That I focus yeah, <laughs> the perfect view. Yeah, I've got it. I've yeah, got that's, a, that's no a big thing, and and that's one of the problems that I've had with Fuji is that they are known to not have as good an autofocus as, say, Sony has, um, and but yet it's still worlds better than the autofocus I was using five and ten years ago. So yeah. it's like people complain about it, but I'm like. If I'm not, it's like you can you can complain that the car you're driving doesn't ride as nice as a Mercedes, but if you've never been in a Mercedes, then you really don't know. <laughs> so it's the same sort of situation with me. I'm like, the autofocus is much better than what I was using before on my Canon. So yay, though it's not as good as a Sony. Yeah, but I don't use Sony and I haven't held a Sony. And if, and if I used a Sony and, and and I might be blown away by the autofocus and be like, well, I've got I've got to have that now. Um, but you know, how how good does it have to be? You know, I mean, you know, better is better is better is nice, but the, I feel like the technology is moving so fast and everything is getting so much better, so much faster that trying to tie yourself too much to a particular feature like that in a camera is a mistake or especially in a brand, because next week Nikon will come out with a camera that will have the best autofocus. Yeah. You know, I, I think that I think that nowadays, more than ever, when you're selecting what brand you're going to go with, that you can consider more things like ergonomics and feel and how the camera looks and how do you feel when you're using the camera and price that you can really think about that stuff because it doesn't matter what you, Nikon, Canon, Sony, Fuji, you're going to be just fine. You exactly. know, you really are. You know, there's a lot of marketing so, hype around sort of individual yeah. aspects like on Yeah, because they, they, they got to sell something, right? You know, like, and I know people who are, when we talk about the new uh, X100, and they're like, well, I'd really like it if it was better water sealed, if it was completely water sealed without having to put a filter on the front. And I'm like, where are you going with this camera that the water sealing is such a problem? Yeah. You know, are you shooting in the rain? You know, so you have to put a filter on the front. It's not that big. I mean, yeah, it'd be a nice upgrade, but it wouldn't be like, well, I've definitely got to upgrade now because they put full water sealing on the Fuji X100 travel camera. No, no, you don't. You know, also, I've, I mean, I've, I've shot in the rain with the X100F and I've never had any problems. I mean, not like not in the yeah, worst down. Period. Exactly. Yeah. And that's like three stages back from the, the latest one. That's the second yeah. one. And now they're on the fifth one and they're announcing the yeah. sixth one next year. And I can't figure out what they're going to do with the new one. 
because that's the problem with camera manufacturers. When they come out with their new brand, it's like the upgrades are so minimal because they've gotten so good at everything. So what are you going to do next? You know, I, I think yeah. the next thing we'll start to see is we'll start to see more machine learning. We'll start to see more AI in the camera, like you're getting with like you're getting with phones now. More adjustments exactly. made to the to the image. Yeah, that's the next big frontier, I think, for the big manufacturers. Exactly, and incidentally, you know, that's actually uh, partially that's what I really like about about the Fujis, especially the X one hundred F that I use a lot, um, is the fact that you can use so many different, uh, you know, Im like picture profiles in it, and you can literally. I mean, I know this isn't like exactly. So exactly like you know on a phone or or AI or anything, but it's just the ability to actually just change, you know, the overall look of your images and and right. create them yourselves as well. I really enjoy that. I often, you know, when I go into into London, for instance, which is about from where I live on the in you know the suburbs of the suburbs, it's probably about like a forty minute train ride or something. You know, I often sit on a train and I will just change, you know, play around with picture profiles or or come up with with new little things that I'm going to be using. And that's, I like it. It's great. Right. It's fun, you know, and yeah. we don't get a chance to have fun much anymore with our cameras because we shoot, we shoot full time. That being said, what is your favorite film sim in the Fujis? Um, I've made it up myself. So it's sort of a, it's a little, it's sort of a crossover between, for the color ones, it's a, it's very similar to Kodachrome, I think, you know, it's that kind of, it's, it's that, that kind of look. Um, and then I, at the moment, I go through different stages with different black and white um, settings. So right. I, at the moment, I have a very contrasty uh, black and white setting, but I also like quite um, almost like faded out black and whites, you know, that are not, you know, where the whites are not 100% white and the and the black points raised quite a bit. So, so, you're, so you're in two complete opposite extremes then. You like yes, a really completely. contrasty, hard levels image, but you also like a really muted Flat yes, image. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, isn't that isn't that isn't that frustrating trying to decide which one to use or trying to I mean that, that, so, that yes. so that's so frustrating when you've got when you when you like two completely opposite things, especially if you're trying to yeah. do it in camera. Exactly. And I used to be that's I used to confuse myself with that all the time. And I used to be sort of because I'm not the most decisive person this put this way, right? I can never make up my <laughs> mind about anything. But um what I do now is and this is the one thing I've learned about myself, it's I'll basically go into town, like when I, you know, when I have the opportunity to do some street photography, for example, which I love doing, um, I'll just say to myself, today, I'm only going to use this one thing. That is all right. I'm going to do. I'm only going to go black and white. And I'm only going to get, I'm only going to go hard contrast. That is it. And then no matter what the world throws at me, it's a little bit like, I imagine I'm out with a film camera and all I've got loaded is black and white film. And that is it. Right. You know, and, so, and you shoot, and you shoot JPEG, so you can't change it. So I do shoot, well, okay, so this, this is where I cop out a little bit. I do shoot JPEG. Yeah, you shoot JPEG raw. And, and then raw, later, yeah. if it's like, you know what? This would have been better yeah. in color. You can pull it back on the raw. Ah, Very, so you are cheating. Now, here's my challenge well, okay, so, to you, my friend. I want you to set it to JPEG only and right, go into okay. London and be like, okay. I'm shooting black and white with a hard uh, level setting. And, you know, if I don't yeah. get it in this setting or if I get something that's not good in this setting, so be it, it's lost. Yeah. And to, to be fair, and, you know, and is, to make it worse, you have to shoot with the OVF. Oh, <laughs> to shoot, oh God. You have no, to shoot okay, with yeah. the optical viewfinder right, right. so okay, you can't see it in camera. That's a good idea. Turn the screen off so you only see it when you go home. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Listen, I've, I I have a list of things like for my for my YouTube channel, which is Boo Ray Perry, by the way, on YouTube. A little plug. Um, All of, things of, you know, videos that I, videos that I need to make. And one of my videos is I call it the OVF challenge. And that will be what it will be. I will, I, like I will it. go, I, like I will go, I will set my JPEGs to a certain color science, a certain SIM, and I will use the OVF. And then I will go spend the day shooting. I don't know what, and I won't Ooh. see it till I get home and put it in the computer. I feel, I feel it. I feel a Tamper London challenge coming on here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Except <laughs> you've got, kind of... except you've got London to shoot in and I've got Tampa. So really not at well, all the same because I could go into London with, with a, 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 stint, a pad and a pencil and draw better images than you're going to produce walking around Tampa. Cause Tampa is well, just as homogenistic as you could possibly. You, meanwhile, you're walking past a, okay. a bathroom that was built before our country existed. Okay. So I tell you what, okay, let's, let's, let's massage the, let's change the challenge a little bit. Right. So we'll make, so I live, I live on the very outskirts of London, right? Uh, technically right. still in London because there's a ring, um, 
the highway that goes around London called the M25. And technically speaking, if you live inside of that, you know, ring highway, then technically you're in London. If you live outside, then you're technically out. I can see the highway from where I live. So that's okay. how close I am, <laughs> you know. But the nearest town to where I live is a town called Watford. And Watford is by far one of the ugliest towns I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> it's completely uninteresting. It's uh, it's a bit boring. So so let's make it a Tampa Watford challenge. And we would have to go and shoot OVF, JPEG yeah. only, and and the challenge would be to get it right in the camera the way the old guys used to do it. Where oh, all you deal. can do, yeah, yeah. all you can do is look at your meter and guess. Yeah. You know what? This needs to be underexposed by a stop, or this needs to be. That's that would be so embarrassing for us. Oh yeah, it'd be fun. It'd be fun. <laughs> yeah, when the when the images are done, it'd be like, well, all of this is crap. <laughs> be, you know, because we wouldn't be able to adjust anything in post. We wouldn't be able to see it while yeah. we were doing it. And furthermore, yeah. there would have to be a limit on how many you could shoot because otherwise you'd bracket. Right. You're like, well, I'll just shoot three and I'll shoot one plus one, one minus oh, one. Oh yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, no. yeah. So that'd be like, no, no, no. No, no, no. It'd be like we go downtown and you get, you know, like 50 frames. Okay. 50 frames. What can you get in 50 frames? And yeah. there'd be a time limit. It'd be like you have one hour and, you know, 50 oh. frames. Because I otherwise, actually, you, you know, you, you could spend all day to get your 50 yeah, frames. Yeah. And no, that's, like, that's true. Actually, you know. that's that's actually that's a really good idea. And I do like those challenges. Yeah, we, we have the buildings of quite the challenge now with this. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Hey, let me just jump in real quick to tell you about the amazing sponsor of this episode, Platypod. Platypod offers innovative camera support systems designed to unleash your creativity. With their stable, versatile, and portable solutions, you can capture stunning shots like never before. And I'm not just saying that. As the host of the Camera Shake podcast, I can personally vouch for Platypod's incredible products. They've become an integral part of the show. In fact, I'm surrounded by various Platypod products holding up lights, cameras, microphones, and so on. It's really helped to transform the way I make the show and the way I shoot at home, in the studio, and on location. But don't just take my word for it. Explore Platypod's website at www.platypod.com to discover their range of products, including the Platypod Extreme, Platyball Tripod Heads, and the brand new handle, of course. Make sure to follow Platypod on Instagram and Facebook at Platypod Tripods for exclusive updates, tips, and giveaways. By choosing Platypod, you're not only investing in your photography, but you're also supporting the Camera Shake Photography Podcast. Thanks again to Platypod, our amazing sponsor. Platypod, where innovation never sleeps. And I'll tell you why I love that. And that's actually the exact reason why I originally bought the X100F, was because I wanted, I wanted limitation. You know, um, I, yeah. I love the fact that it, you know, you can change the lens, it's got fixed lens on it. Um, I just love the fact that it, you know, that's the lens you got. Um, and you know, you just have to live with it. And if you want to zoom in, you have to just use your legs and you know, and that's, it's just what it is. And I just, uh, that I found that really attractive to have that limitation because that's, that's the problem in modern day photography, you know, even on your phone, you can zoom in and out and you've got three different lenses or however many lenses on your phone. And, you know, you, you've got all these options. Um, I think for me, sometimes creativity is, is sort of, uh, it's an end result of limitation and restriction rather than having all the choices all of the time. Well, having that camera also be a 35 millimeter equivalent also gives you that situation where everything you shoot with it is kind of what you were looking at. You know yeah, what I mean? Exactly, Whereas yeah. if you have like a big zoom lens, then you're, you're really zoomed in. You weren't really seeing it that way. And if you have a super wide lens, you weren't really seeing it that way either. Your eyes don't look that way. Uh, so uh, that's a very, that's a very cool feature. They do have a digital zoom in the camera, so you can do that. Um, but um, I got to tell you, I, I did a video of every, everything I say starts with, I did a video on my channel about this. I did a video on my channel about uh, the next one because they're going to announce the new camera next year and what could they possibly do to upgrade it? And I made a suggestion, which there's no way they will ever do it. But I, I'm like, I'm just going to go way out and say this. I absolutely would love it if they would make that camera have interchangeable lenses, but only three lenses and oh, yeah. they have to be, they have to be leaf shutter lenses just like the lens that's in it. Because the leaf shutter is a big part of that camera. So it have to. So it, three leaf shutter lenses, and they would just be like a wide, a medium, and a little bit of a zoom. So like you say, a, like a, 
like a 18, 24, sort of somewhere in their equivalent full frame. The one we have now, which is like 35. And then one that's maybe 50, maybe okay. 75. And that's it. And small lenses, prime lenses and, and leaf shutters. So it would really be special. The camera would be so special because no one's got that. Right. And, 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 uh, and I, and I made this suggestion also because I just can't figure out what they can do to improve it. Uh, yeah. It's, it's dang near perfect. That camera's dang near perfect right now. Listen, by the way, we've done this happen so many times on podcasts, especially when I'm talking to somebody who's a Fuji shooter. We spent the whole podcast talking about the Fuji cameras and we haven't said one thing about the actual premise that we started the whole podcast about, which you, which was what was, uh, how to become a better photographer. Isn't that what you, <laughs> exactly well, what think, we were supposed to be talking about yeah to be fair though i think you know there's there's a lot of, a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about is is really something that goes back to the core of of what photography is and actually what makes you a better photographer you know and, and often what makes you a better photographer is actually to take a lot of the choices away and really just focus on the one thing you know i remember when um when yeah. i first when i first started started out in photography i really had to because the thing is you know i was surrounded by the photography really when I was growing up because my dad was a photographer and my grandmother was a, was a photographer and all the rest of it but I really didn't know what was what was what and when I got into it I had to really sort of get my head around just individual components of photography like I had to literally think okay depth of field what the heck is that and right. how can I influence that and what is the effect of it and so on and so forth you know and then um and then you, you know with the first time somebody said like, oh, what do you know about the exposure triangle? I was like, triangle? What, like, huh? the, you play it? <laughs> like, I, was a yearbook, I, was a, I was a yearbook photographer in high school. And um, the amount of information that I did not know about photography would kill a herd of oxen. I mean, I, I, we're shooting, all of us, we're shooting for the yearbook. I didn't know, I didn't understand depth of field. I didn't really understand aperture and shut. I knew I had to have a, uh, I knew I had to have a high speed film if I was going to shoot sports. But I didn't understand any of it, really. I'm just out pointing and taking pictures. It's amazing that we managed to even put out a yearbook. And I mean, I, and, and the dark room was like, you know, you learn that in a day. And now the stuff that I know, it's embarrassing how much stuff I didn't know when I first started out. And I did a, um, I have a series on my channel uh, called Blu-ray Explains. And it's because I see so many people who want to learn photography and they don't know where to start. So I thought, you know what? Let's start at the very beginning. Like if I had to teach someone who did had never touched a camera before how to be a photographer, what's the first thing I would teach them? What's the first thing they would need to understand? So I wrote an ebook about this too called 20 Definitions You Should Know. And it's a free ebook, by the way. If you go to my channel, you get to my channel. It's a free ebook. And it's 20 definitions you should know. And the idea was before you start taking classes on photography, you should understand these 20 definitions. You know, aperture, shutter speed, depth of field motion blur, grain, noise, uh, depth, uh, uh, you know, these, you need to understand these things because these things are going to be talked about and referenced by people as if you know them. And if you don't know them, you're going to be in trouble and you're going to fall behind. You know, what's focal length? What's a zoom lens? What's the prime lens? Um, and I came up with 20, but still it's such a small inkling of what you can learn. I mean, I don't know how long you've been doing this, but I've been doing this a long time. And still every once in a while, sometimes once a week, I'll see something. I'll go, oh, I, I didn't realize that worked that way. <laughs> you know, I, I, I didn't yeah. realize that it was how, that was what that did. You know, I can't tell you how many things I learned in the process of making my Bure Explains videos. Because it would be like, okay, well, now I have to explain this thing. But before I make the video, let me just look it up and do some research to make sure I've got it right in my head. And in the course yeah, yeah. of doing that research, I would discover something I didn't know. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, but that's—I think that's a—that's a beautiful thing. You know, I find that a lot. Um, I used, you know, when I used to teach guitar, for instance, I used to find it a lot. Like, you know, once you spent, once you've been playing the guitar for twenty-five years or something, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you do automatically without thinking about it. You must have learned it at some point, but then you've forgotten it a long time ago. And you, now you just do right. it. Um, and every time, you know, I had to teach beginners, I have to actually explain how this stuff works. Right. You, you know, more often than not, I'd be like. Oh wait, let me just actually. I need to really look into that. I'm doing that. Yeah, at the they moment, don't. They don't it. know. What, yeah, they don't know yeah, what yeah. a hammer on is or a pull off, uh, and they don't know. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, yeah, I get it. So how, that's you know how to hold the pick, <laughs> you know, right? How to hold, exactly. The pick I mean, you're totally like ah, yeah. So that's uh, so with me with my 
with my channel and stuff, I get a lot of people who buy the Fuji X100 series and know nothing about photography. And I want them to, right? I, yeah. you know, I, and I think you probably experienced this, this too, is that people who really, most people who really understand photography and do it for a living or really love it, it's a joy to them. And they want other people to experience that joy. It's like, I know you th see it as, as this hard math equation that we do with the camera, but there's a joy to it. In the same way that a person who paints and loves to paint, there's a certain joy in understanding how to mix colors, you know, how to, how to, how to mix your oil-based paints together to get them to do what you want. There's a joy in, in understanding what those 50 different brushes are for that you have sitting over there. You know, and meanwhile, I have no desire to learn what those 50 brushes are for. Yeah. But to a painter, this very technical stuff it's exciting to them because it, it opens them up to be creative, you know? So, yeah, um, exactly. yeah, you want to be a better photographer. I think that that's where it starts is you need to get into the nuts and bolts a little bit. You need to understand the nuts and the bolts of the camera, the exposure triangle, and you really need to understand light because so many people wait until the last moment to yeah. understand light. And I'm like, you understand that if you hand me your cell phone, I'm going to take a better picture with that thing than you are. It has, it's not the, the camera is a great tool. Don't get me wrong, but a photographer who understands light can take a better picture anywhere, any time of day, because they yeah. simply understand light. They can see it. You know, my, I, my ebook, my, um, ebook on uh, natural light photography, the main focus of that ebook is just trying to get people to be able to see the light. Can you remember when it clicked for you? Like when suddenly you realize you started looking at the world in a different way? Like, when, when, like if I'm just sitting around looking at people, I will notice, oh, that's good light. Oh, that's bad light. Oh, that, that person's face is in bad light. That person's face is in good light. There's like a point when it clicks for you, you know? Yeah, like I was on a Zoom call. Yeah, I was on a Zoom call with a bunch of photographers one day, and one of them texted me, and he was like, you have the best light in the Zoom call. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, because he's just sitting there looking at everyone's light, and he realized, oh, you've got like two thirds uh, lighting, uh, 45 degrees off the left corner, and you, you know he can just recognize the portrait lighting that I have set up on my face here, in my, in my yeah. for my Zoom call. And I'm like, yeah, that's a photographer. That's a photographer. People talk about all the technical stuff. I'm gonna know that's a photographer. Yeah, somebody who can see the light, and and not only can they see it, know it's good, know it's bad, but also know how to put you into the good light. Know where to find it. It's like a scavenger hunt. Go outside at noon and try and take somebody's portrait with no with no off camera lighting, and it's like okay, you have to know. Here's what I'm looking for. Where's the wall yeah. that's blocking the sun? I can put them in that shade. I can pull them forward to the edge. They'll get a little bit of a rim light. I can turn their head just a little bit this way, and suddenly I've got studio quality lighting. You know, in my garden. Exactly. And so I and yeah. Yeah, and often, often it's it's a matter of like you know posing somebody so they turn their head in a, in a certain way so that you know all of a sudden you do have you know you do get the shadow or you get the the triangle of light you know under the eye and you just you know you can you can mold the subject to really you know to interact with the light and that's what I found you know find super super interesting. Um, yeah, because I get so many people who are, who want to talk about the gear that I'm using or what's the you know oh what softbox are you using and blah blah blah. And they don't understand where that needs to be placed, how high it needs to be placed and how it needs to be angled. And I'm like, that's what you need to learn before you start worrying about which softbox you're using. Because yeah. you can use any softbox and get a good yeah, picture sure. if you know how to place it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the thing. The, the gear almost doesn't really matter. You know, um, it's, it's, it's very similar with strobes. Like, you know, I've been using, oh my God, I've been using, um, I, I've been using Interfit honey badger strobes for absolute donkey's years. They're cheap, cheerful, they're bright yellow, and they're basically similar to the old Alien Beast. You remember like the, the cubic, like cuboid type of type of stroke, uh, strobes? The reason I yeah, use I have, them is because- I have Alien Beast B800s in my yeah, studio. Yeah, exactly. And I just literally just took them out last week. Mm. And are you ready for this? My studio is now constant lighting. <laughs> okay. My studio is constant lighting. I, I, I am using a company called Zion. Uh, they're lighting me right now. A company called Zion makes these really cool constant lights that are flat. They're like, they're, they're like, instead of being long into like this, they're wide. So there's a very short profile. And if you have a low ceiling, that means you can push your softbox higher because it's not sticking out the back of your softbox so much, right? Yes, exactly. And they're super bright. And they're very convenient, very cool looking, and I like them. And I tried them for my headshots and stuff in my studio, and it was fine. 
wonderful. And it's all real time now. So when you step the person in the light, you can see them right then before you ever go to the camera. You can see if the light's right. Yeah. You know, in, in a way, go ahead. What do you find is the main difference um, between shooting with strobes? If, I mean, so uh, here's my experience. For a lot of people, a lot of people find it difficult to get into strokes because, of course, they can't see what the end result is going to look like um, right. immediately. So, you know, placing placing the um, you know placing the modifier or placing the light, um, deciding on the intensity of the light or uh, how soft or hard it should be, it's, it's a difficult judgment to make. And you're going to have to refer back to the screen, you know, constantly. So you take a photo, it's like a test photo. You look at it, you go, okay, well, I've got to change this, got to change something else. Um, and it's a process, basically. But with constant light, of course, you can see immediately what your end result is going to look like. But where do you think are the advantages and the disadvantages of using constant light instead of strobes? Well, one of the things I one of the things about constant lighting, and well, one of the things about using strobes is I feel like if someone's like, "Oh, I don't know if I can use strobes," and then my question is, "Do you play pool? Can you play pool? Do you like playing pool?" And if they're like, oh, I can't stand pool, then you're not going to like strobes because that's what strobes are. You have to be able to look at it and envision where the shot's going to go. You have to envision the light's going to go from here and it's going to come down to here and it's going to hit this reflector and then it's going to go over here. You have to be able to see it just like when you look at pool or, or for you or for you British people, uh, snooker or billiards. Snooker, uh, yeah. <laughs> You have to you have to be able to envision the ball is going to hit this ball, which is going to make it travel in this direction and hit the bumper and it's going to come off at this direction. And that's what you have to do when you're using strobes because it's not real time. You can't see it happening. So you have to know, OK, I need to place this not pointed at their face, but in front of them. And I actually pointed at the reflector that's on the other side. And that's going to give you a two light effect. And you have to be and so you have to be able to think visually that way. And if you're a person who can't think visibly visually, then you are better off going with constant light. Uh, the biggest drawback to constant lighting when it comes to doing studio work, it is the power. You just can't, like with my strobes, I can go outside on the brightest day of the year and stop down to to save the sky so I don't lose the sky, to bring down the whole atmosphere, to bring down all the ambient. And my strobe can power up and just get no problem can light them. My B800s were set at about 1 16th of a power for my headshots. My constant lightings, which are 200s, my constant lighting is set at 80% power and I'm a, and I'm a stop more ISO. <laughs> and I'm almost ma I'm still almost maxed out on that light's power. So the big benefit of strobes is power. But if you're working in a studio, you don't really need that power. I mean, the fact that I had, I could have had 400s, I could, because those, those 800s that I was using in the studio, I was, I never, ever shot above a quarter power. So all that power was just wasted. You know, so the biggest drawback to to using constant lighting is if you've got to have a lot of power, um, if you've got to set them way back or if you've got to work outside in bright sun, you're not going to have it. Um, the drawback is, like you said, being able to see it in real time. And now, I mean, it used to be the big drawback it used to be that we get so hot standing on the hot lights was horrible. But that's not the case anymore because now it's LEDs and they don't, of they course. don't get hot. Yeah. So now that we've got cold light, oh, my gosh. Right. And uh, that's just wonderful. And being able to see in real time is great. And the other, <laughs> the other drawback is, um, and this is a minor thing, but paparazzi. So like if you're doing, like if you're going to do dance pictures at some dance place, right, with all the kids and their little skirts and everything, and that's going to be great. And you're using constant lighting, you're going to be fighting the moms off with a stick because they already want to take a picture the minute you put them in front of that backdrop. But now they're actually yeah. lit well. Right. Right. So, so one of the constellations that you have with um strobes is that when mom's like oh and they've got their camera out you can be like let them take pictures because they're going to be crappy because they're not lit well that's not the yeah. case if you've got constant lighting on them they're lit great so i don't use my constant lighting on location i only use it in my studio all right what's this what sort of shutter speed do you uh, shoot with when using constant lighting uh 160 one 100 somewhere around there I, uh, I, it, I, I like to have, if I can, I like to start it around one, 100 because it makes it really easy. Of course, it doesn't matter with constant lighting because you know, there's no, there's no sync speed that you have to worry about, but that comes back to my days with strobe. I, my default settings are always to have my shutter speed at 100 because it gives me a stop in either direction 
that I can go to without having any problems. So if I have to go down to one fiftieth of a second, I can still handhold. And if I have to go up to one two hundredth of a second, I'm not I'm not uh, over the flash sync speed yet. So it gives me a stop. So I can change my shutter speed and make my background, my ambient light, go one stop darker or one stop brighter without affecting my flash. But which is another thing that's different about constant lighting. That's another great thing with flash is that if you're shooting with manual flash, especially, and you're not using TTL, you can just change your shutter speed to change your ambient light and your flash on your person's face stays the same because your shutter speed doesn't affect your flash power, uh, your flash exposure. But with the constant lighting, yeah, you change anything in the exposure triangle, you change everything. So if you change your shutter speed, you got to change your flash power to compensate. It's Absolutely. a whole different world. Yeah, it's a completely different world. I'm, you know, I'm using constant lighting predominantly, of course, for video, you know, and um, and even that, I, you know, I had to start thinking about. Well, I just I had to start thinking differently. Let's put it this way, you know, just using constant light. Um, this actually, I tell you what, video is actually another thing that's um, that I find very interesting because obviously now, you know, in this time, in the time of of cell phones and you know iPhones and everything else. And one thing I find, especially when I look at my um, my my youngest daughter, for her, the the line between stills photography and video is completely blurred. Like to her, there's almost no difference anymore. It's just natural the way she progresses from taking a photo to taking a video. And I find that um, that's a fairly new phenomenon because back in the olden days, video cameras and stills cameras were completely separate things. Yeah. Now, when we look at, you know, contemporary um, mirrorless cameras, you know, you have one camera that's, that does two things really, really well. And then, of course, cell phones are made to be good at both. So, so that's, you know, for me, I find that really quite interesting to see that, to see that line getting very, very blurry, because that's the one thing I come up against um, every time I'm at a, a camera club, you know, a, a photography club where, you know, I'm usually talking to a slightly older audience and there's, there's always a lot of resistance when it comes to video. Like every single person in that room holds an amazing video camera in their hand and they've never even used the function. <laughs> you know, Why do you think that go. is? I, but, but by the way, I'm one of them. I, I, it's not a resistance to video. Yeah. It's just, I, it's like, it's so hard to be a good stills photographer. Don't ask me to also be a good videographer. So the way I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? I see it, yeah. yeah, I mean, the, what I always think I think about that. Um, it's I think that if you've if you've accrued a lot of knowledge when it comes to stills photography or photography in general, you know, like learning how to read the light, you know, learning, you know, knowing about depth of field and the, the exposure triangle, all the rest of it then those are really the basics of good cinematography. Oh. As well, except. Yeah, except. the very little basics. But if well, you're really into it, like I yeah. love movies. And so when I'm right. watching a movie, I'm watching every cut. I'm noticing that Dolly Pan. I'm noticing yes. that his oh, zoom. Yes. I'm course. noticing how many edits went into this one scene and why those edits are done yes. that way. You know, so, and so if I get into videography, that's it's the same reason I never got a drone. Because if I got a drone, I would I would spend so much time trying to be good with the drone, and I've only got so much time in the world, and I and I need to devote some of that time to being a good photographer, you know. Yeah. Uh, so like, yeah, I can take a camera and shoot video, sure. But it's one of the reasons that my my channel, my YouTube channel, is is like this: that it's me sitting in front of my computer in my office, as opposed to me being with a beautiful backdrop and beautifully lit, all that kind of stuff. It's because once I go down that road, I will spend so much time trying to make that perfect, and and less time trying to come up with something interesting to say. You know, my wife yes, doesn't want to turn me on to that because I I absolutely want to be that way. And my wife, she has an online boutique, and she was like, "You really don't need to worry about it. People don't care." She goes, "The people do not care. All they care about is your content." If your content's good, they do not care about your lighting. They do not care about the quality of your video. They're used to TikTok. And I was like, yeah, but I care. My photography friends care. And she goes, you're the only ones who care. Regular people don't care. Because when she did, she does live things with her studio and stuff online. And I'm like, you know, I can set up cameras and lights and blah, blah, to make this better. And she's like, nope. She goes, they, they don't like it. They don't care. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to them, the, the people who are watching, which, which is a shame, don't you think? Yeah, that's true. I think... Um... I think it's one of these things that, you know, if you if you get involved in something, it's 
it's one of these things where you want to, over time, you want to get better at something. And so for instance, you know, I can take, you know, I can take this, this podcast as a, as an example, because of, of course, for those who are, you know, listening on audio, you know, as I remind you every week, there's also a fully fledged video version in full Technicolor over on, over on YouTube, of course. But if you went back to episode one, you'd realize how <laughs> crap that looked back then. You know? yeah, my, <laughs> so, my podcast was the same way. People are like, I just started watching. I'm going to binge from the beginning. I'm like, oh, please skip the first 100 episodes. Yeah, please. just, yeah, yeah. Go, go yeah. straight in at, uh, I don't even know where we are. What is it? 169, I think it's this episode. So you know, <laughs> go in like at 160, I think. <laughs> That'd be all right. Hey, but here's ten, something but, you should look up, by the way. Hmm. I mean, I'm going to interrupt because I'm going to forget this because I'm sure. old. Uh, if you're into videography and you're into movies, there is a there is a YouTube video out there that breaks down the opening scene of the social network. Oh, where okay. he is just sitting talking to his girlfriend, and it breaks it down shot by shot and explains it why it's such a perfect scene, and it's like when I saw this scene, I just thought it was two people sitting at a table having a conversation, and then when it gets broken down for you, you're like. Oh my God, there's so much work that goes into just filming two people sitting across from each other and having a conversation. And not only on all the ways that they shoot it, but in all the ways that it's edited. And that's basically what that video is about is the editing. And when you watch that and you're like, just to get this scene required this much knowledge and understanding of how to push in just a little bit closer when they say these words, because it gives more emphasis to what they're saying mm -hmm. and how to do this and how to, and when to cut and when to be on this person, but you can hear the other person and when, it, and you just like, oh, I think this is fascinating, but please don't ask me to learn it. It's, it's you know. You know, it's the it's storytelling aspect of it. You know, it's yeah, the, but it's, it's, oh my gosh, it's so much work. Whereas with photography, it's just like, compose the scene, shoot it, done. There now, of course, yeah. you say that we we say that, but everyone who's coming up knows. Oh yeah, great! Until you spend another hour in Photoshop, that's true. yeah, yeah, yeah. And of that's course, true. until until you get to you know where you know you want to you want to convey a certain emotion or something you know in in the model, and then you get into the fine detail of that. But what you know, the thing I love about um, about video really, and and always have loved, is the fact that you can tell a story over time. Whilst you know, in a in a right. photograph, for, for me, what makes stills photography in a sense difficult is that you're telling a story in one frame, unless you do right. the triptych, in which case you tell a story over, you know, across a number of frames, which is cool. Right. Right. But, um, but in, in video, you have the ability to, you know, to, to tell a story over time and therefore you can throw curveballs wherever you choose to, you know, you can deceive the, the viewer or let them in into some secret or something, or, you know, you can, you can reveal and all the rest of it. And so I find it super interesting. Um, and a quick, quick question. Okay. You've done both. Which would you rather do spend an hour editing a video or spend an hour retouching a portrait to perfection? Oh man, that's like, that's like asking me to choose between one of my kids. <laughs> It isn't for me because I absolutely <laughs> would rather spend the time because I feel like an artist when I'm retouching the video, retouching the portrait, but when retouching the video, I just feel like it's mechanical, but it's not, it's, it's truly not. But like <laughs> my YouTube videos are usually recorded in one take. You know, yeah. Everybody else records it and then they cut it, they splice it all up. So their heads jump and did it because they want everything to be quick, quick, quick and clean, clean, clean for the YouTube crowd. Mine are one take. My YouTube videos are like this podcast. I turn on the camera and I talk. And if I have to take a drink of water in the middle of it, I just take a drink of water in the middle of it and I don't edit it out, you know? And I just, and it's because, oh, editing, what a pain. What a, it's almost like the more you do it, the more you, for me, the more you lose the magic of the performance. And I get that it's not true anymore that doing retouching makes you lose the reality of the person. Uh, but go. I like retouching my face to make myself look better, but I don't enjoy editing a video to make my video easier to watch. Isn't that weird? Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I agree with you actually on, you know, to, to an extent, the, the thing I like is, um, is that you can, you, you can sort of convey a different meaning depending on how you edit something. So it's like, yeah. you can actually put like undertones into it and, and all the rest and you can, you can throw hooks and, you know, I often, I make little things like, for example, I very often make little videos on my phone, right? Well, um, I, like a good example is a friend of mine sent me a, a, a taco recipe the other day, which, you know, 
and and in order for me to prove to him that I actually put that I actually made the thing, I made a little video of me cooking, making the mix, and you know, creating the right. whole thing. And so, I cut this together in 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 a video that basically showcases the whole sequence in like under five seconds. And that was fun because it had to be so fast. And yet I had to, you know, I had to still describe the process as I had to be coherent and you had to sort of be able to comprehend what was going on. And yet it had to be super fast and sort of limited in sort of time. And that was a, it was an, it's a challenge. It was a really nice challenge. I quite, I quite enjoy doing stuff like that. So I'm not necessarily always like, you know, editing, you know, Hollywood movie type things far from it. Um, but I some I like to put the story aspect into it, um, and it just strikes me that since we're holding the technology for that in our hands, and actually to me, you know, the first step to to video is just thinking about a story element over time, which then kind of comes back to how do you edit it and all the rest of it. And I've realized, you know, that's like there's there's a learning curve involved. But you know, I don't know. I like taking on the I like, I like, I like, you know, getting confronted with a new piece of software sometimes, and then just thinking, okay, how can I make this work? Because that could be cool. <laughs> it's like I love, I love movies, but if you've ever watched a movie being shot or seen how it's shot, and you realize that it's like, okay, so that scene you were watching, where you know, it starts with the guy walking into the cafe, you know, and you see him get out of his car, and you see him open up the door, and you see him walk in. That's three different shots. It took a day. Maybe two yeah. days just to get just to get those three shots that you don't even think twice about. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, you, being on a movie set is kind of the, yeah, it's I mean, being on a movie set slow. Exactly, oh. it's so boring. It's incredible. So unbelievably slow and tedious. You know, okay, we're gonna have you open this door and you're gonna open it four or five times. Okay, that's good. All right, great. Well, go back to your trailer while we set up for the next shot. That's gonna be an hour and a half or two hours. You know, yeah. while we move the cameras around and relight the scene and. You know, or, 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 oh, there's a scene where there's a conversation with another actor and you're going to do that scene 20 times because, yeah. you know, or more because we're going to do it once. We're going to do the wide shot. First of all, the establishing shot, you're going to have to do it five or six times in that take. And then we're going to do it from your angle, close up on her and then her angle, close up on you. And then we're going to do a couple of other things and you're going to need to do it the same way every time. And you're going to need to pick up the glass and drink from it at the same time in every video <laughs> and every time you do it. And you're going to have to, and I'm just like, actors man that's why they make so much money and i don't want to yeah, have yeah. to do that you know i don't i and that's the other side is i always think of myself more as a performer than i do anything else because i was a performer for years so being a radio disc jockey for 20 years that's why i do what i do that's why video is like anything no i just want to open up the microphone and do my thing and and then go home <laughs> that's, why. that's why you're so good at it though that's the that's the thing yeah well i don't know if i'm i don't know if i'm good at it but that's that's my that's my take on it. Whereas other people are like, they want to produce something that looks perfect. And I'm like, no, I just want to, because I don't, I don't think of everything that I do on camera as being like this very important one-time thing I do with photography. Your portrait is important. This one picture has to be perfect. But the stuff that I do on video, it goes back to my DJ days where, where I'm talking five, six times an hour on the mic for four hours. And then tomorrow I'll be doing it again. So it's like you do it and then it's gone. Like my own podcast, I never listened to it. You know, my the when Gary and I yeah, did yeah. the podcast, which we just right, we did four hundred episodes of that podcast, and I never listened to them. Every once in a while, if something particularly funny that I thought happened when we were recording it, I might go back and listen to it. But otherwise, no, it's gone. You know, yeah, yeah. I put yeah. it out and I and I move on. So I maybe maybe that's why I don't enjoy editing video so much. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I'm the same when it comes to the podcast because you know I have to edit the thing. By the time I'm done editing it. I've listened to enough of it. <laughs> and then, you know, that's right. already on to the next thing. Well, I never I never edited uh, our podcast. One of the deals I made with Gary when we started the podcast, I said, the only way I'm going to do it is if I don't do any of the editing or the work because I don't want, I just don't, I won't enjoy that at all. I enjoy doing it. Like I enjoy this, what you and I are doing. This is what I enjoy the most. I enjoy this more than anything. Yeah. So I, I don't, the editing is, uh, no, I like live. I do. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, hey, by the way, quick plug, by the way, quick plug, if you are at all thinking about uh, signing up for the International Photographic Competition, which is PPA's competition, the largest in the world, it changes this year. You need to get your entries in now. Go to PPA.com if you are a PPA member and sign up for IPC and get your images in. They will be giving away $26,000 cash this year Whoa. in the competition. And uh, it will be judged on Saturday at Imaging USA. 
in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and then that'll be in January. And then on Monday night at the awards ceremony, we will do the final judging head to head for the images in 16 different categories, and I will be the host of the whole thing. So come to Imaging USA, get yourself, ed- get yourself some education, and uh, come, if not participating, still come watch the competition because it's exciting and fun, and come say hello to me. And in saying that, actually, you've touched on something that could be, you know, one of the one of the final points I think we, we could talk about in this in this episode. Um, but one of the greatest ways that I've always found to get education um, as a photographer, especially when you're starting out, is to go to shows like WPPI or like the if you're in the UK, the photography show in, in Birmingham, for example. Um, it's such you know, this there's so much on offer when it comes to workshops, um, talks. I mean, it's incredible how much it's incredible how much I've learned in the time. Well, there's so many there's so many different aspects to it. Like when you're first starting out and you go, it's like every class you go to, here's somebody who's doing successfully what it is that you want to do, and yeah. they're going to tell you their secrets, right? And you're like, oh my god, and you're filling up notebooks with ideas, and you come away supercharged. And then as time goes on and you know more, then it becomes networking. So. I can't tell you how much business I get every year because another photographer sends it to me who I've met at a show or, or, you know, cause I got involved in my local guilds uh, and that sort of stuff. And networking is something that's kind of lost um, on the, on the current generation because they don't join clubs and stuff anymore. They just do everything online. But man, the people who do, we know the secret of it, which is, you know, oh, I got a, got a wedding. I got a wedding in two weeks that I got because a friend of mine uh, doesn't do weddings anymore. And he's been taking pictures of this girl since she was a little kid. And she came to him and said, Hey, I need you to do my weddings. And he's like, I don't do weddings anymore, but I have a good friend, Bure Perry, who does. And go to him. Yeah, ben, absolutely. There's yeah. there's a bit, there's a nice big job that I didn't do a single thing to earn, other than be friends with this person, you know. And yeah. I do the same absolutely. thing back to them. So you get that, and then eventually you get to the point where you go to the show simply because you want to see 150 of your friends that you only see once a year, you know. Yeah. And and that and and you go. It, it's 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 a vacation with all your friends that you get to write off on your taxes because yeah, it's exactly a, because, it's a, because it's a business trip. Yeah, and getting involved in topics. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I remember, two, I mean, just you mentioned, you mentioned them, you know, meeting your friends. Two years ago, uh, when um, the first photography show happened live in person after the pandemic, um, I remember the feeling like walking up, you know, to like walking into the hall and like seeing lots of people that, that you know, you haven't been able to actually meet and talk to in person for like the best part of two years at that time was just it was incredible and so for me being at shows like that it, the social aspect of it has always been the, the you know the overriding factor that's really the main reason why i went and the fact that i can you know i can join just about any talk and i can pick up a lot of really useful information it's never really been for me personally it's never really been about the gear and i know a lot of people go to shows like that because they want to get hands-on experience with with you know, the latest Canon or Nikon or Fuji gear or whatever. Um, and of course it's a great opportunity, but it's just so much more than that. It's, you know, it's. Oh, and, but also if you go, depending on what you got, like, if you go to Imaging USA, the trade show at Imaging USA is the largest one in the, in the industry and it's unbelievable. And not only is everyone there. And so you can see everything and get hands on with everything, but the big manufacturers are going to have live stuff happening in the trade show. So like the Canon booth, for example, they've constantly got live speakers. So Lindsay Adler is going to be up there teaching you how to do portrait lighting in the middle of the trade show. So it's like you go, you go see the people doing their programs like me, and then they shut down the programs for the trade show and you go to the trade show, there's more programs in the trade show, (laughs) you know, you know, and uh, the trade show takes two days just to go through. You know, and I, and I enjoy it. I always come across things in the trade show that I'm like, oh, there's a backdrop I haven't seen before, or there's something uh, that I like. And also walking the trade show means you run into everybody who you, you know, haven't seen in two years or three years and you get to say hello. It's just wonderful. Conventions are just fantastic. I absolutely love going to them. I'm very excited for the, for Imaging USA in January because IPC is going to be all new this year and I'm going to be hosting it. And so it's going to be, and there's not, I, I love a high pressure situation. I really do. So it's like, Okay, here we go. We've never done this before because the way they're doing it now is before IPC was was part of a whole system where you got marriage for your degrees and everything in PPA all through the same system and not anymore. Now, if you want to become a master photographer, that's a whole different system in PPA. IPC is just a straight up contest. 
So what happens is they put all the images go in in 16 different categories. They get judged by 15 different judges and then ranked. And then the top 32 images in each category go into a bracket system and they go head to head at Imaging USA Live. So if two images come up, two men enter, one man leaves. <laughs> and they come up and this one's out. And they come up and that one's out. And then bam, 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 until we go from 16, we go from you know, 32 images to uh, 16 to eight to four. And then on Monday night, the final four in each category go head to head until eventually you have a winner in each category. And then those images go head to head until you have the overall grand imaging award winner. And that image wins $10,000. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So it's going to be Fantastic. very exciting and very fun and a live audience and, uh, and, and something that's never been done at the, at, uh, at Imaging USA before. So you should come over from your little island, your I little know, island in Europe. <laughs> I know I should, I should absolutely. I think that's the plan. <laughs> that's the plan at some point. 2024, I think is what's going to happen. You know, well, if you so came over, there'd be plenty of people for you to hang out with. You got me, you got Gary and that's all, really, all you really need. If you know me and Gary, yeah, you're going to yeah. know everybody. I know because everybody everybody knows us and we know everybody. So if you hang out with one of us, you're going to meet a thousand people. Exactly. Well, that's that's definitely the plan. Before you know, for me, um, over the next um, well next month, I'm going to be in in Norway teaching uh, teaching portrait photography in the Lofoten Islands. So if anybody's you know listening to this and you come out there, that's a it's a beautiful part of the world. We have some <laughs> get this. So we're going to be in the Lofoten Islands, right? Two hundred miles north of the. Uh, equator, uh, not off the equator, off the Arctic Circle. Actually, I'm not sure whether that's 200 miles or 200 kilometers. One of the two, whatever they use over there. Um, anyway, it's going to be cold. Let's put it this way. Yeah. Um, but it's essentially, it's the place where uh, the Vikings sailed out of when they went to um, ransack the British Isles back in the day. So it's like, you know, it's a bona fide, like the Viking birthplace. But we're going to be, I'm going to be teaching portrait photography there with some real Hollywood Viking models. So the full <laughs> shebang. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to be, we're going to be shooting full on Vikings in the full armor with, you know, with weapons, shields, the whole shebang in their natural habitat. So that's oh, that's awesome. Be, yeah, it's going to yeah, be amazing. Let me, let me ask you this. Like, I, I, I think people in America are always jealous of the folks in Europe, because we just feel like you have better locations than we do. I mean, you've got London, you've got Paris, you've got every every town in every small town in English is a England is a quaint little village with stone houses and and you know and and we just feel like you've got so much more to work with than we do. Do you feel that way? Like when you think about Americans, or is there anything that you envy about us in terms of what we have access to as a photographer? Oh, big time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because actually, I think from a European perspective, it's very often the exact opposite way around. Because, you know, for, for us Europeans, it's always like you think of the, you think of North America, for example, you know, say the US and Canada. And you think like, wow, you've got like, you know, great beaches, you've got, you know, tropical, um, you know, tropical weather, like in, in Florida, for example, you've got amazing landscapes, deserts, you know, to the Rocky Mountains. Yeah, I mean, that's you cool. know, and so... You know, and so like at the weather, I mean, you know, I'm in the UK. For some reason, there was a heat wave in Central Europe. There was a heat wave in Northern Norway. And for some reason, I'm sitting on this island and it's been raining cats and dogs for the last six weeks. Well, that's one thing we, that's one thing I absolutely don't envy you. And that's uh, the weather that you have there. Like here, yeah. we have a, we have a rainy season in Florida for about a month where it rains a lot. But other than that, no. I have a friend of mine, yeah. uh, Scott Johnson, who's a, a, a Fuji X ambassador in London. I know Scott. And, uh, I know Scott. You know Scott? Yeah, Scott. I know Scott. Yeah. And uh, and uh, everything. He, his feed is always just like, oh, it's raining again. You know, oh, the weather's horrible. You know, and my feed is always like, oh, another beautiful sunny day in Florida. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's course, it. You know, it's eighty eighty five percent humidity and ninety eight degrees. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, you know, I, I don't really understand how I ever ended up in, living in the UK because, you know, I grew up in the south of Germany where it's a much more continental climate and it's, it is, um, you know, we have longer, hotter summers and uh, and also long, cold winters. But, you know, it's either really cold and blue skies and everything, or it's really hot, which makes for a really nice summer. And for some reason here in the UK, it's just, it's much more temperate, so the winters don't get that cold and the summers don't get really hot. 
it's it's always just plodding along and it's there's always a hint of rain in the air. <laughs> you know, it's like ugh, what, I, think, I, think, I think that I think we think of we think of England and we think of Europe as everything is so much closer to each other as the way we think about it. So you're like, yeah. oh, you've got great beaches, you know, and you've got oh, you've got a desert. Yeah, they're two thousand miles apart. You know, yeah, yeah. That's you know, you know, we feel like we feel like with England, you can drive a short direction in any way, any direction and get something that's radically different look than what you've got where you are. Whereas here in Florida, it's Florida everywhere for five hours. No matter where you go, it's Florida. <laughs> it's you know true, I mean? yeah. it's going to look like Florida. It's going to look pretty much the same. You got beaches, but everything else is just yeah. Florida, Redneck Central. You know, and yeah. if you're in te if you're in Texas, if you're in Houston and you want something that doesn't look like Texas, good luck, because it's going to take you eight hours just to get out of the state. Yeah, and, and, that's and you're going to be in Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah, no, that's like, true. That's true. But you know, yeah, just to give you an example, guys, like, it's like, well, we'll just go over to Paris for the day. <laughs> the way, at least well, that's the way it feels from my perspective. Yeah, yeah, I know. But you know, for, for instance, just to give you uh, give yourself a sense of scale, like um, I'm I'm driving to the south of Germany uh, in about a week and a half, you know, right. and it's going to take me 14 hours to get there. So yeah. Uh, it's it's still quite a trek, you know. It's it's um. It would be like an you hour say, and a half. You, you, plane. Say, you say that's a trek, but uh, you're talking about another country. Yeah, right? yeah, I know. If I drive yeah, 14 yeah, hours. True. I'm in Louisiana, which is in the middle of the country. Yeah. I'm at one end, and it takes it'll take me. It it takes 20 hours to get to uh, Dallas, Texas, from here. Dallas is in the yeah. middle of the country, and I'm you know because like I said, literally because of the panhandle, it literally. If you're going north and then you're headed west, it literally will take you eight to 10 hours just to get out of Florida. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you can't drive in, in England. You drive eight or 10 hours in any direction, you're in the water. Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, eight hours. I mean, you could probably eight hours. It'll take you seven hours to get to Cornwall, which is the southern, the southwestern tip. And then there's water after that, yeah. You're probably yeah. right, yeah. So we, we just always, we're, we're always, and I've never gone, I've been to England uh, but I've never gone over there to work. And I'm always like, oh, I got to find some, I got to find a conference or something over there that'll bring me in to speak just so I can come oh, yeah. over once a year and shoot, you know? Yeah, yeah. You should definitely, um, so this, the photography show in Birmingham you should check out, uh, which is happening again in March. They changed it. It was it was uh, originally happening in March and because of COVID, it was changed to September for two years running. And now I think it's back, back to March. So um, that's going to happen this March coming. Um, that's a great, that's the biggest um, photography trade show in Europe now since Photokina is no more in Germany, which used to be the, the biggest, but that's, you know, that got canceled. So, um, so yeah, I think it's, as far as I know, the photography show in, in Birmingham is now the, the biggest show over here. And it's great. It's, it's actually super fun. Um, in fact, you know, Scott Johnson was there. Um, did I see him last time or the time before? I can't remember. But uh, yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a great show to come to and hang out for sure. Yeah, I would love to do it. It's just flying across the pond. The price is so bad that nobody wants yeah. to pay to have me come over. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. We got plenty of good photographers here locally that can teach a class, Boo Ray. We're not going to pay for to fly you across halfway yeah, around yeah, the true. world just to teach a class. You're good. You're not that good. For anybody who's who's thinking about getting into photography now, right. what would be right. like your number one tip for them? What would be the, the one thing that you think they should do to get started in photography? Well, I would say start by going to bureperry.com slash education and downloading my two free eBooks. <laughs> uh, I would say the first thing you do, and I, and it sounds, I know it sounds like a plug for a free eBook, uh, eBook but the first thing you wanna do is learn your basic definitions. Uh, learn your basic definitions. It's like, I wanna be a race car driver. Well, first you have to learn where the gas is and where the brake is and how to work the shifter and, and where the turn signal is and, and so forth. And I would say that's where you start. So learn your basic definitions so that you understand how a camera works, so that you understand the exposure triangle, so that you understand how this device records images. You don't have to, but it will make everything easier for you down the line if you do. I really believe that it, you know, you can, you can be like, oh, I'll, you know, I'll get into the nuts and bolts later, but you'll find that if you know the nuts and bolts from the very beginning, everything makes much more perfect sense to you. So you're trying to understand that if your, if your ISO goes from 100 to 200, that the scene gets brighter, twice as bright. But if your shutter speed goes from 100 to 200, the scene gets half as dark. That right there will make your head explode. Right. And, and if you don't understand why that is, 
you won't be able to remember it. It'll just be some weird mathematical concept to you. But if you understand that a shutter speed of 100 is really 100th of a second, and a shutter speed of 200 is 1 200th of a second, so it's actually a shorter length of time that the sensor is exposed, and so as a result, less light gets into the sensor. If you understand that sort of stuff, it'll make the whole thing easier. Because once you've got that down, it's in your back pocket. And then that's when you dive into light learn about light before you start learning about how to pose your model before you start learning about i want to take special kinds of pictures this way and i want to use off-camera lighting and gels and what kind of modifier should i use and blah 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 just learn about light get yourself to a place where you can take a camera or a cell phone or anything like that into any room or outside anywhere you can find the best light and take a good picture doesn't have to be the best picture ever taken but you understand what good light looks like and where to find it once you've got those two things down, everything else is just a piece of cake. Because I, th I think those are the two hardest things to learn in photography. It's the technical side, which is math related, and the light side, which really comes to changing the way that you see the world. It really does. You have to, get, you, you have to become a person where I, I, I walk through a city, and as I'm looking around at the city, I'm also looking everywhere I'm looking. I'm like, what's the light in that spot? Would it be a good photograph there? My family, it's hell because me and my family are walking around. We're walking. I'm like, hold it. See that little alley right there? I bet if I put you against that brick wall, where's the light? Where's the sun? Okay, come here. Come here, baby. Come here. And I've got my five-year-old. She's not five now, but her whole life has been, come over here. Stand right here. Lean right here. And yeah, okay, that's good light. Let me take that picture. You know, my, uh, my, uh, we, we were at uh, Universal Studios one time and my wife and daughter had to go back to the hotel to get something. So while they were gone with my Fuji X100S at the time, me and my youngest daughter just went around the park looking for places we could take good pictures. Yeah, just looking for the right light, looking for the leading lines, looking for the funnel, looking for you know different places you know that we could work with. Uh, and that right there to me is the real essence of being a photographer. The technical stuff is important, but really it's just being able to see light and understand light and what you can do with it with your camera. How's that? Fantastic. That's fantastic. Fantastic advice. Great. Thank you so much for uh, joining us uh, this week on the Camera Shake podcast. It was an absolute pleasure having you on the show, of course, as always. And, uh, you know, like, like we said earlier, I, I feel a, a challenge coming on. So, you know, we'll... <laughs> we'll follow that one up in a, in a later yeah, episode. And yeah, we could, sure. do, we could put something together. I think it, it could be pretty cool. Yeah, it could be I think so, be yeah. Fun. It'd be, yeah. It'd be super fun. <laughs> fantastic. Again, thank you so much for being on the show this week. My pleasure. Okay, folks, that's all for today. It's been fantastic catching up with Blu-ray again. But before we go, let me just recommend another episode that I think you like. Check out episode 165 with Gary Hughes, where we discovered how to beat the AI robots at their very own photography game. I'm sure you love it. If you enjoy our content, consider supporting us on buymeacoffee.com to help us continue creating and bringing you more exciting episodes. It really does mean the world to us. And for those of you who are listening to the audio version of this podcast, uh, just be reminded that there's a fully fledged video version over on YouTube with plenty of examples of our guest photography in full Technicolor. All you have to do is go over to YouTube, search for Camera Shake Podcast, and you'll be able to watch all past episodes on there. And if you are on YouTube already, well, get in touch and leave a comment. And remember to hit that like button, ring the bell, and share with your friends. You can help us reach a greater audience all over the world. Once again, thank you for listening and watching, and I'll see you again next Thursday. Thank you.